Hey, so I am Nathan Prey here from the Prey for Nathan show. And I'm here today to talk to you about the Eastern Red Cedar, whose botanical name is Juniperus Virginia. And I'm here to tell you why this is one of my favorite trees. I first encountered this tree in the backyard of my cottage, but I didn't really think too much of it at the time. There were just two cedar trees that we had to wait for them to grow, and they took forever to grow, so we could finally put a hammock in between the two. And eventually, the uh, maintenance structure changed in Rondo Provincial Park. They decided to, let, to stop cutting a lot of the parklands. And this is where the eastern red cedar started to take over the landscape. I come mostly thought of this as a reed tree at this point. But apparently this tree typically grows as a fence row along highways, back roads, and where there are open fields that are not routinely mowed or maintained. It's a great sight to see them popping up on the Rondo Beach. Like I say, this tree will spread rapidly in abandoned areas, making it a nice succession tree. Although some people think it as a reed. But unless there are deer nearby, because deer will put a damper on its growth and development. It has been documented, though, as a threat to prairie and scrubland ecosystems in the United States. In the past, fires have been used to keep this tree at bay, and in most recent years, controlled fires have worked. However, controlled fires are not as viable as an option as they were in the past due to the uh, populations that surround them nowadays. Here one can see the range of the eastern red cedar. I'd also like to point out that the eastern red cedar is actually not a cedar at all. It is a juniper-sized tree. It just looks like a cedar. This tree has many things going for it, such as it is resistant to extreme drought, heat, and cold, which makes it a perfect tree for the sandy beaches of Rondo. This also makes this tree a bedding favorite on surviving climate change. It is very tolerant of a wide range of soils, can grow in poor, dry, alkaline soils, as well as rocky outcrops and even wet, swampy lands. Very versatile. It is tolerant of windy conditions, which makes it a great species for windbreaks, and was planted heavily in the 1930s to offset the dust bowl conditions devastating the nation. It is tolerant of salt, which means it can be used on new roads, driveways, and sidewalks. It is also a significant source of food and shelter for wildlife. The blue fruits on the female trees are consumed by a wide variety of wildlife, including cedar wax rings, which is named for this tree. As you look at the trees in such places like Rondo, you can see how the deer populations love this tree, especially in the winter, as the low-hanging branches can't be found. Another pro, this is a moderate to long-lived evergreen, with some trees reaching over 500 years old. It has a deep penetrating taproot, and as it ages it grows a shallow fibrous root system, which allows it to persist on outcrops and save land masses from erosion. It will grow about a 1 to 2 feet per year on a single trunk matures at about 40 to 50 feet, and has a spread from 8 to 20 feet. There are reports of some specimens reaching 80 feet high and 30 feet wide. Male and female trees are separate. The females produce green flowers, and the males produce yellow flowers. The females produce small, quarter-inch, fleshy, berry-like cones that appear in the spring and mature in the fall. The berries are generally blue with a whitish bottom, giving a gray-blue appearance. They contain one to four seeds in each berry. The males have brown pollen-bearing cones on the branch tips. The pollen is dispersed by the wind. The fragrant scale, like foliage, is sticky to the touch and be coarse or fine cut. It ranges in color from gray or blue-green to dark green and tends to bronze in the winter. I find them to be a sticky tree when touching the bark due to the sap, and I find the saplings tend to be sharp on the skin. Now there are a few problems with this tree, one of them being it doesn't like full shade. But the biggest problem is it is an alternative host for cedar apple rust, a pathogen that is destructive to palm fruit trees such as apple, pear, and crinzies. It should be planted 500 feet away or more from palm trees. Galls containing the fungal spore appear on twigs in early April as tiny dimpled growths. Warm spring rains trigger the galls to produce gelatinous orange starfish-like protrusions called telehorns. They're super cold. The horns dry up in the fall with the arrival of dry weather, but by then the rust spores have floated away. One can spray with a suitable fungicide in early April to prevent this. The eastern red cedar tree has many uses. With the heartwood of the tree tending to be rot resistant, colonists used it to construct furniture 
rail fences, poles, coffins, and log cabins. I still come across an old fence row telephone pole made from eastern red cedar when I'm out hiking. Since the scent repels moss, the aromatic wood has been used for centuries in the construction of chest, closets, and wardrobes to prevent wool and clothing from being destroyed by moths. The sawdust wood chips can be used in kennel beddings to repel fleas and minimize odors. Prior to the 1940s, pencils were made entirely out of cedar, but have since been replaced by cheaper woods or synthetic materials nowadays. Now here is a strange one. In the past, it was used as a Christmas tree. But I must say nowadays, there are far better specimens. Now I hear down south they are still using this as a Christmas tree. But since they are very slow growers, they are being replaced by faster growing trees. However, when indoors, it has quite the scent and makes it instantly feel festive. Let's go back to wildlife. With its dense branches, it provides important refuge and shelter for many songbirds and game birds. Quails, bobwhites, rough grouse, pheasants, and turkeys. Butterflies and small mammals also benefit from the cover this tree provides. At my family cottage, all the birds go to the red cedar to make sure the coast is clear before heading to the bird feeder. Since the soft silvery bark peels off in long flexible strips, squirrels and other mammals will use the bark as some of their nesting materials. The berries are also an important source of food for more than 50 bird species, as well as a variety of mammal species including foxes, rabbits, raccoons, skunks, possums, and coyotes. The twigs and foliage are often eaten by hoofed browsers such as mule deers and white-tailed deers. You may have heard that the berries are often used to flavor gin, but that is actually another species. It is believed that the eastern red cedar berries are mildly toxic. Native Americans did make tea from the twigs as a remedy for sore throats and coughs though. How does it dis propagate? Birds and small mammals eat the berries and disperse the seeds all over when they poop. Very easy to propagate from seed, and you will see many young saplings everywhere you go in Rondo. It is relatively free from diseases and pests. Bagworms should be picked off and destroyed before the eggs hatch. It makes a great hedge, border, screen, or windbreak in landscape settings. So hopefully throughout this video, I have shown you why the eastern red cedar was the first tree picked for my tree series. As it is one of the most common trees I see in Rondo. It really stands out because usually there aren't any other trees around it, especially in the campground where they've gone to increase the privacy of it. I hope you enjoyed this video and I look forward to hearing your comments, especially feedback as how I can make some tree videos and better content for you. I'm really going out of my comfort zone in this and I appreciate you watching and your feedback. Remember to like, comment and subscribe. And thank you for watching the Pray for Nathan Nature Show.